Welcome to What's the 411. I'm Keisha Wilson and I am sitting here with producer, songwriter, CEO. Am I missing any titles? No, you got it. You got it. <laughs> Charles Bronxon. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Now, you have been on What's the 411 before, and for those who didn't catch you during the first interview, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a, a CEO, CEO of my own imprint, Mound Records, and it's an acronym for Makings of Unforgettable New Records, and I'm a songwriter as well, and I produce music for myself as well as other artists. Um, can you tell us maybe who you've worked with in the past? Um, well, the, the only artist that I've released is an artist named Haley Smith. We did a project last year called I Miss My Daddy. And we put the video out last year. And we we did we just recently put the, the song, we got it on radio. We put the song on radio for the first time. And the song is doing phenomenal on digital radio stations. It's, it reached like number 14 on the top 150. Oh, that's great. And it's also, it's been on the, the, the global top 200 for like the past six weeks now. Oh, that's it's really awesome. doing good right now. Yeah. That's awesome. And you are a songwriter yourself. How long have you been in the music industry? And I'm always amazed by songwriters and, and wanting to know how did you get into songwriting and what are some of your inspirations? I I thought I could try to write a song and no, it just doesn't really work. So I just mm. always am amazed by the, the, the ability to do so. So I just wanted to know what are some of the things you write about, your inspirations, how did you even get started? I guess I would say I got started into songwriting via hip hop, rap music, because with rap music, it's imperative that the artist writes his own material. It's, it's different from R&B. R&B, a vocalist can sing a song that was written for them by somebody else. As long as they can perform it in such a way where it's just like they, they give a stellar performance, they can get away with it. But with hip hop, if you're a rapper, you have to write your own stuff. So I started in little rap groups writing songs and stuff like that, and it just snowballed, and I got into R&B because that's really where I come from. Like, I have a real R&B bass. I love harmonies, and so I started applying the technique of writing to R&B, and then it just got me hit. Okay, did you go to school for being a producer or songwriting, or did you just kind of naturally had a gift and you honed it on your own? Yeah, I just honed it on my own. I didn't go to school for it. It's just something that you just start developing your craft. The more you do it, the better you get. And so, who were some of the R&B influences that you had um, growing up? Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder. And Stevie Wonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stevie, um, Donny Hathaway, Marvin. Marvin Gaye was a big inspiration. Um, man, in the vocal groups. The vocal groups. Wow. Real big influence on them. Do you sing at all? Yeah, I, I, I sing so that I, I mean, I have to. You know, I'm more into the writing, though. Okay. I always wanted to be in a vocal group. But not like a luther sitting on a stool, a, a stool <laughs> singing, nothing like that. Okay. But yeah, I definitely do vocals. Yeah. Okay, great. So you, when you came last time, I believe you were here uh, talking about the project uh, with Haley Smith, correct? Right. Um, could you just tell us what you've been working on since the release of that song? Yes, I'm currently working on or well, I, I recently released a project entitled group hugs and hugs is an acronym for honoring unforgettable groups of soul and this project we, we released it during black music month and there are four music videos that that come from it and the project started out with me just paying tribute to the groups that i was familiar with like Blue Magic and the stylistics and stuff like that. But then it, it grew when I started learning about all of these different vocal groups from back in the 40s and the 50s that we we really don't get to hear that much on the radio. And I wanted to 
shed some light on those groups because it was so great. And I put it into the song as I was putting it together and what was supposed to be about a three and a half minute song snowballed into about an eight minute project. And my intent from the beginning was always to generate funds and donate them to organizations that are in place to help older artists or the artists that are not recording anymore. And so that's what I'm doing right now. Um, all the proceeds from any digital downloads of the song Group Hugs are 100% going to the Living Legends Foundation. Oh, and what yeah. is that foundation? That foundation solicits and collects money to assist all of the artists, black artists from the past who are no longer recording, who may need uh, medical care or just down, you know having hard times and they need assistance. Like there was an artist who was in need of, a, the, um, of heart surgery and the Living Legends Foundation stepped in and, and they assisted and helped to see to it that that bill was paid for the artists. Yeah, because you know artists still don't have unions that are in place to collect money for the artists who are no longer recording. Right, and I think, I guess, you know, times have changed and it seems to be, you know, there's more money, I guess, coming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that artists, although I think it's taken a little bit a different path with the digital downloading and where um, people aren't really buying albums and CDs like they used right. to back in the 80s, 90s, right. and 70s. Right. So, um, and they're touring, so I can imagine that, you know, with the advent of time, people who come later on tend to get reap more of the benefits in terms of wealth than the, those that come before. So I would imagine that, you know, that's where, you know, that need for that Living Legends Foundation comes in because, um, you know, people fall on hold on hard times. And yeah. could it could use... Um, Assistance and also kind of recognition, like, hey, you you were one of the first to do this. Because of you, I am here, or I can do this. So right. uh, this is my chance to kind of give back. Yeah, and, and we have to stop and get away from that thing of referring to our elder artists as ha has-beens, or when they're no longer recording, call, saying that they fell off. That's not the case. You know, we, we have to start revering the ones who came before us and until we start doing that it's, it's not going to get any better yeah. it's not going to get any better you know and the, the contracts were structured haphazardly back then in the 50s and the 60s to where the artists were they were never really set up so that they could benefit financially from the work that they put into the industry so you know, now it's a little bit different, but yeah, those artists are struggling. A lot of them are struggling right now. So you are the CEO of your own record label. Did I get that right? Yes. Do so. Um, when you have artists, do you kind of guide them in terms of how you know smart decisions to make or things they should think about as they are pursuing their career in the music industry? Yes. Yes, definitely. I always, I would tell an artist what I would like to hear as an artist going forward. What's one of the pieces of advice that you give to anyone who's starting their careers in the music industry? What's like one of the key pieces of advice that you would impart to uh, that person? Learn how to write. Write your own material. That way you're not stuck waiting for somebody to come up with some material for you. In between albums and projects, you can sit up and you can come up with material that you can not only record for yourself, but you can also give to other artists so that you can benefit that way from your creativity. Um, since your background is R&B, how have you seen R&B change over the course of the years? You have mentioned, you know, your Stevie Wonders, your Marvin Gaye's, and now, you know, that was 70s, 80s, now we're moving into, you know, now we're in the 2000s. How have you seen R&B evolve? 
And do wow. you actually, how do you feel the direction that it's going? Well, that's how the, the group hugs project came about because it started out with me just, I was just paying tribute to the artists or to the groups that I was familiar with back in the day when I was coming up. The, those songs that I used to hear my parents playing in the living room when they had parties. But the more I got into the project, I started learning these things about the industry that I did not like. And I couldn't understand why we didn't have that R&B that we had back when I was a kid. And it was completely going in a different direction. And I decided to incorporate everything that I was learning into this project. So I'm not only paying homage to the groups, who made that good R&B. But I start to talk about subject matter pertaining to the industry as it relates to R&B music. And I was lucky to, to be present at a forum that was held over 20 years ago that had Mr. James M. Toomey on the panel. And Mr. M. Toomey predicted something way back then about where R&B was heading. And I made a song entitled Black Music Without Black People. And that's what M. Toomey had predicted. And that's exactly where R&B went. We don't have R&B like that anymore. And I talked about that on the, on the project. I talked about I have a song called The Demise of the Personality DJ. Why we don't have those radio personalities that we used to have, like the Frankie Crockers and stuff like that. And uh, why we don't have black owned radio anymore. And that's part of the problem why we don't have R&B that we used to having back in the 70s and the 80s and stuff like that. And I also dealt with appropriating black music, the appropriation of black music by white artists on a song entitled Pretext. Pretext is an acronym for prejudice restricts exposing today's extraordinary talent. And it's a phenomenon that has been in place since way back during Little Richard's time. Little Richard's time. And I use the example of the appropriation of black music with what happened with Little Richard and Pat Boone. It was an artist named Pat Boone, a white artist, who, when he sang the songs that Little Richard had initially recorded, he made them like 10 times more popular than Little Richard because the white stations wouldn't play the song that Little Richard made. It took a white artist for them to play that. And you trace it from back then all the way up to now, where you see the white artists getting all this love singing R&B music. And I, I dealt with it. Um, in terms of appropriation, I find, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that sometimes there's a fine line between appropriation and just having a genuine appreciation of the music and doing what you have grown up. like. If a white artist grew up listening to R&B, like your like Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and those type of influences, and that was what's in their home, so when it was time for them to create their own music, you know they drew in what they knew and what they appreciated. How do wh how do you um, what do you think the line is? Like what is the the delineation between doing what you enjoy, what you love, and what really comes naturally to you into appropriation? Well, the, the problem is not the artist. Because the artist, it, it's okay to have been influenced by a particular genre of music, in this case, R&B music. There's nothing wrong with that. Especially when you give credit to who inspired you. The problem is how the predominant media, in this case maybe pop radio and white media, will emphasize the white contribution to R&B more than they 
emphasize or even give any kind of attention to the input that black artists made to the genre. You know, it, it's something that I said in one of the songs. It's like when I when I talk about this, I'm not ridiculing the artist. I'm just ridiculing the system. And I say, and just because I mention this, don't accuse me of doing hostile music. I'm just tired of the emphasis being placed on white artists doing our style music. While our contribution somehow wind up in music history's trash bin. How much longer are we gonna sit and watch white artists become legends while black ones become has-beens? You know, so it's not directed at the white artists. It's just that, you know, when a white artist does it, it's like all this, this, they act like it's just unbelievable. Like, oh my God. You, you know, they praise him so much just because he's singing an r and song. With an, a, a, a black artist, he won't get that kind of attention. How come Tank? is not played on a pop station. Tank had a song called Stronger. Listen to Stronger by Tank. It's a pop record. Just like You Send Me was a pop record by an artist named Sam Cooke and pop radio didn't play the song. Not because it wasn't a great pop song, but because he was black. You know? And that's, that's a huge problem. Yeah, I think that's gonna, that, that's a tough part of, you know, that's what America unfortunately was based on is this kind of thievery of, cult, of cultures and overtaking different cultures and projecting theirs as what's right and what should be uh, generally and widely accepted. So, you know, I hope you, know, you made a good point about the lack of black owned radio stations. And I, that was something that I never even thought about, but it makes perfect sense. And so I would love, you know, to one day see a shift in power to make it even, you know, to make it a more even playing field for African American artists. Right, because. You know, if, if we owned our own stations, we could program our own music on that station. You know, and that's that's a huge problem. It's, it's one thing to have a black formatted radio show and station, but it's a whole different thing when you have a black owned radio station. Yeah. Because you can talk to issues pertaining to black people without this fear of, oh, what are the... The, the boss is gonna say, or the people in, in, in the boardroom gonna say about what we're talking about. Right. You know, that, that's not real control, and that's not real black radio. Right. So this project sounds really interesting and a great listen. Where can our viewers buy your work? Um, you can get the Group Hugs project on all the digital download sites like iTunes and Amazon and Google Play and it's available on Spotify and you can check out all of the videos associated with it, group hugs in its entirety um, pretext um, RIP which is radios and comparable personalities which is dedicated to all of the great DJs from the 1940s going forward you can check all of those videos out in their entirety on my YouTube channel and my YouTube channel is Mound Records, M-O-U-N Records. And um, I'm on Instagram, at Mound Records, <laughs> like the pictures Mound, <laughs> without the D, M-O-U-N Records. And my Facebook and Twitter handle is at Charles Bronson. That's C-H-A-S, Bronx, son, as in Son of the Bronx. <laughs> Excellent. Now you've wrapped up this project. What is next for you? Oh, uh, man. Next, I'm trying to figure out which of the five videos that I'm going to release that I recorded that, that I'm going to release next. Um, I'm also a part of a group called New York. New York is a group of cousins that produce music. And um, we got some material coming out. So it's, it's a few things that, that's coming. But right now, I'm going hard on this Group Hugs project. So all of my focus <laughs> is right on that. But there will be more material coming from Charles Bronson and Mount Records. Great. And New York. <laughs> Great. We can't 
wait to hear from you again and we invite you to come back when you want to just chat about what you're working on next and um, check out all of his handles his Twitter handle his Instagram handle his YouTube channel can I catch everything digital platforms right. yeah. yeah catch him um, well thank you for joining us thank you I appreciate you <laughs> no problem Life, uh...